Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we have made the conscious decision to rejoice and be glad in it. We are grateful that God has allowed us, amen, to have one more day walking on the topsoil. We thank God for all that he has done for us, for allowing us to see January the 10th of 2023. I'm Bishop George McCree, and I'm the pastor of New Vision Christian Fellowship Church here in the city of Mesa, Arizona. The address of our church is 9350 East Brown Road in Mesa, Arizona. This is just east of Ellsworth. Amen. Our service times on Sunday is, is at 2 p.m. And if you're in our area, we'd love to have you come in and be with us. Before we go into our lesson uh, today, we want to uh, remind you of a couple of things uh, that will be happening this year. And we'd like for you to mark your calendars and, and be with us. One of those things is our, our conference which is with the Fellowship of Christian Believers, of which we are a part of that organization. Uh, our biannual conference is going to be in the beautiful city of, of, of Albuquerque, excuse me, of Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. Excuse me, let me get something to drink here. Albuquerque, New Mexico, amen. And the dates are, are July, 12th, 13th, and 14th. So a uh, plan, if you will, uh, to, to be with us there in Albuquerque. Uh, you can see information about hotels and uh, schedules as they come available uh, on our church website, uh, Fellowship of Christian Believers website. Uh, and again, we'd love for you to be with us. And of course, we're celebrating this year, our church, our 20th year anniversary. And so we're gonna be doing little things throughout this year. And also uh, we are going to commemorate it on the 28th of September uh, for a couple of day services and also for a banquet. So uh, there are things that we're looking forward to and trust that you uh, will be with us, amen. Today, we want to pray for those that are still sick and shut in, those that are still challenged by COVID-19, those that are struggling in relationships, those that are having issues in their hearts, in their minds, in their emotions, in their spirits. We want to pray for, for you today or for them, if it's not you, a family member. We want to keep them in our prayers, amen, that the, the will of the Lord will be done in their lives. Let's pray. Eternal Father, we want to thank you for this day, but certainly this is the day that you have made, and we have made the decision to rejoice and be glad in our day, regardless of how good or how bad the day has been, things in the day. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for you are the creator. You, Lord Jesus, are the author and finisher of our faith. And we know, Lord Jesus, that all things work together for good to those who love you and are the called according to your purpose. So, Father, we pray for, for each one in my hearing, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for those, Lord Jesus, who are not able at this time to even to view this live stream. We pray, Lord Jesus, for their homes. We pray for their health. We pray for, Lord Jesus, their, their spirits, Lord, that, that you would increase, Lord Jesus, your presence within them. And Father, we pray, Lord, for the lesson at hand, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. And we will praise you, God, and the glory and honor belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we are grateful for you tonight. And uh, we are going to uh, begin, uh, we've been speaking about profiles in courage. And uh, for the last, I think it's been uh, uh, 
two uh, classes, we've discussed uh, a man by the name of Samson. And we're hopefully going to finish talking about him uh, tonight. Certainly, there is much more that we can say about him, but uh, we are going to hopefully conclude on him and then move to others who have shown courage in their lives as they were, uh, as they dealt with things that happened in their life. The purpose, of course, is for us to recognize that things happen even to good people. The purpose is for us to recognize that you being a child of God uh, are not um, exempt from challenges or exempt from struggling, exempt from issues to come into your life. All of us are, are uh, subject to things of this world. We're subject to temptations. We're subject to failures, but we're also subject to victories. Amen. And so I believe that through uh, looking at these different individuals, we will come to the, come to the conclusion that there, there is hope for me. All right. So uh, let, let's begin. And I don't want to take too much time uh, in uh, developing uh, this from the beginning because uh, in so doing, it takes uh, much of our time and we want to talk about Samson. Again, uh, we recognize uh, uh, through profiles of courage uh, that we uh, have seen different individuals who uh, were subject to uh, different challenges. Uh, we told you that Profiles in Courage uh, was a volume of short um, uh, biographies and they, these biographies uh, described acts of courage and integrity that was done uh, by three uh, U.S. senators. And this was compiled and, and uh, created, if you will, by Senator John F. Kennedy in 1956. And he won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for that work. We talk to you about what courage is. Courage is the mental or, or moral strength to uh, persevere, to venture, uh, and uh, withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. We told you that President Delano, uh, excuse me, not Delano Roosevelt, but Franklin Roosevelt, remember there are two presidents, two President Roosevelt's. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, said, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the, the assessment that the thing, that something is more important than fear. Nelson Mandela said, I've learned that, that courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. And of course, you can't do any greater than our God who gave us these words uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and six, be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be dismayed. Don't be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is he that goeth with thee and he will not fail thee nor forsake thee. So we've been looking at, at uh, individuals or primarily one at this point, but we will deal with others that had the courage to overcome failure. We come to you then uh, beginning from the book of Judges uh, where we learned uh, that the book of Judges uh, covers a, a period of time between 14 
1400 BC and 1050 BC. And the book of, of Judges covers a period of time when there was no king in Israel. This was before the kings. Rebellion was commonplace in uh, that nation. The people had become backslidden. And this was shortly after the death of Joshua. So when we look at this period, it is a period after Joshua, that he was the successor of Moses, after he had led them and died, and the coming of the era of the kings with King Saul. So this is the period of time in which they were judged again by judges. Um, after uh, the death of, of Joshua, they uh, became, uh, there became unrest and disillusionment about their nation and, and about leadership and of course about our God. And this in turn led to the appointment of judges to guide them through uh, particular uh, times of turmoil. Most of these can be found in the book of Judges and additional judges in the book of Joshua and in the book of Samuel. Uh, these judges were described as individuals who occupied positions as military leaders in times of conflict. We told you that, that uh, during these turbulent times that, that Israel had uh, formed formed a, a cycle of behavior. Uh, and we refer to it as the, the 5S cycle of Israel. And uh, giving uh, props to uh, that who taught this many years ago, it was uh, our now presider, uh, Bishop Lewis Osborne, C Osborne Jr., excuse me, uh, who taught on this many years ago, and it, it has, has uh, stayed with me. Uh, so what we found is, uh, again, the biblical narrative of judges, uh, which appeared uh, in different tribes of Israel. And uh, the reason for, for this was they used these people, these judges, to redeem the people of God from their enemies. Okay, so he used them to be the redeemers uh, for uh, Israel. The reason for that, again, is that Israel had been found in a, uh, a 5S cycle. The words for the 5S cycle we talked about was number one, sin. Um, the children of Israel would sin before God, whether it was through rebellion, whether it was through idolatry, they would sin. And God, in punishment of this, would send forth suppression, or God would use uh, some of the, the outlining nations to come in and cause suppression or cause uh, punishment to come upon them. They would come in and, and uh, many were had lost their lives through that, or they would take different parts of the country. They would take uh, uh, the, the, the livestock, they would take man, the land, the things that they had done, and uh, they would come in uh, to destroy uh, the, the Israelites. And so because of that, the scripture says that they would suppress um, the nation. And of course, once uh, the nation was under suppression, uh, they would become sorry because they, they realized what it is they had done to cause this. And so they would become sorrowful. That's the third S, sorrow. And when they had become sorrowful, they would do what was the next thing to do. And that is to 
cause there to be supplication or they would pray. So you had sin, they would sin. God would send a suppressor uh, to them. They would become sorrowful or repentant, repentant. And uh, then they would cry out to God asking for deliverance, which is praying or supplication. And then they would get an answer from God. God would send forth a deliverer or a judge, raise up a judge who would bring redemption or salvation to Israel. So Samson was one of uh, those who were made judges, and he's probably uh, the most uh, familiar, the most well-known of the judges. And so we began with him. And our studies of, of this man, uh, Samson can be found in uh, Judges chapter number 13, 14, 15, and 16. It is in these chapters that we find uh, things, interesting things about him. And we find out how uh, God used him even when he failed God, even when he had his own issues, how God still used him. And that's good for me to know and good for you to know tonight that God does not use flawless people, but he uses people that have issues, people who have to overcome different things, who fall down but get up. God uses these for his glory and honor. Those that are weak, let the weak then say I'm strong because it is through our weakness that God's strength can be displayed. And certainly we find that in the life of Samson. We talked to you about five components of Samson's life. Let me hasten on to get to them. The five components of, of Samson's life that we talked about or we'll touch on is Samson, uh, the prodigy. Then Samson's pride. Samson's punishment, Samson's passion, and Samson's prayer. Now, when we look at punishment, we're going to see that in, in more than one light because we're going to see the suppression, the percept, percep, excuse me, of the suppressors that came against Israel and how he uses Samson to punish the suppressors. As the suppressors had punished Israel, God uses Samson as a punishment to them. We talked to you how gifted uh, Samson was in his life, how uh, he had incredible strength, but in our estimation, and as we got this this first thought of how he looked from my father in the gospel, gospel, Bishop Lewis Osborne Sr., and how he depicted him not as a, uh, a, a, a very strong, physically strong, where you could see uh, where his strength lie, but perhaps he was a man of regular stature, uh, a man uh, who didn't look uh, different than others. Thus, the reason why they had to, to seek him out. And then why they asked the question, where does your strength lie? Why would they ask where does his strength lie if he was muscle bound, if he, if he had all of these Hercules <laughs> muscles? they would know where his strength lie. But because he did not look like that, they had to ask the question, where does his strength lie? Samson, remember, was in the hall of the faithful or the hall of, uh, hall of faith found in Hebrews chapter number 11. Yes, with his flaws, with his temptations, with his passions, with his failures, 
he was included in the hall of the faithful uh, in uh, the 11th chapter, verse number 32 says, uh, and what more shall we say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak or Barak, Samson, Jep, Jephthah, F, excuse me, Jephthah, of David, of Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms. I want you to, to keep that, who through faith conquered kingdoms. And this is for you, who through faith will conquer whatever it is your challenges are. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, uh, saith the Lord. It is through faith in him and through his abilities will you be able to conquer whatever it is that you are challenged with today, tomorrow, and in the future. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness. Strong out of, out of weakness. So it says to me that within the weak, something called strength can come out of the weakness. Well, who's, who's that, that strength? The strength is the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ. That does what? Gives me the strength. So the strength comes through Christ, and you're, ha you're having faith in Christ. And it says that they became mighty in war. Okay, so this is so amazing how God uses Samson. The first P we talked about was he was a prodigy. He was a miracle baby. We find that in the 13th chapter of Judges, how uh, he had come uh, from uh, a husband and wife who could not have children. His mother, uh, Manoah, was barren, but yet God used her to bring forth him. Amen. And we find now that it was it was uh, this through this birth that God brought forth uh, that which would be uh, a judge of Israel. We find out that uh, when uh, God made a choice of him, uh, he knew that uh, he would be uh, affected and infected by different things in life. Well, not only is he affected or infected by things in life, so are we. Samson was a man chosen. The Bible says uh, in Matthew, many are called, but few are chosen. So God chose him to do his bidding at this time in Israel's uh, uh, life and in the life of Samson. God chose him knowing what he would be, knowing what he would do, yet and still God made a choice of him. Yes, brothers and sisters, uh, God has made a choice of you. Out of all the people that are in this uh, 8 billion people on this earth, God chose you. He caused you to be a child of his. He caused you to be one of his jewels. He caused you to be one of his vessels. He caused you to be the light 
of the world, of your particular world. Uh, he chose him and he set him apart. Again, the scripture tells us of uh, the prophet Jeremiah uh, that the Lord tells him, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. So God knew about a man, uh, Jeremiah, before he was born. God knew about uh, Samson before he was born. And he said, this is one that I can use. And I believe that God has pointed the finger at you and said, you are one I can use. Uh, when he was born, uh, the angel uh, told his parents, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from birth. So uh, from the time that he comes out of the womb, he is to be of uh, or, or have the vows of the Nazarite. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines, or Philistines, however you want to pronounce it. Now, this vow, the Nazarite vow, this was typically a vow that was voluntary. But God uh, says he will be from his mother's womb. So uh, there were things that uh, he was not to do. His parents were to teach him or to keep him uh, under this vow uh, from the time that he came forth. Uh, three major uh, uh, things uh, of uh, this vow was that he was to avoid from uh, the fruit of the vine, the fruit of the vine. He was not to eat of the fruit of the vine nor drink of the fruit of the vine. That would include a man grapes, grape juice, and of course, wine. He was also not to cut his hair. Besides that, he was to avoid contact with dead bodies. And so uh, this, uh, as he, he grew up, he, he followed that to a certain point. Things changed as he got a little older and, he, and as he began to see different things in the world. Uh, you who, who are bringing your children up in the fear of God, you who are bringing them to church, it does not mean that they're not going to be tempted. It does not mean that they're not going to be challenged with things of the world, for they are going to be um, tempted. Amen, because they are not living in a bubble, even though we try to keep them uh, as uh, away from as much as possible. They don't live in a bubble. They don't walk in a bubble. They don't, uh, the re all of their relationships are not in the bubble. Amen. Um, the second P in his life was pride. Samson grew up under the influence of godly parents, but it's clear that he chose his own direction. You notice in uh, chapter number 14 of Judges that Samson desires a woman to marry that is of the Philistines, uh, of the enemy of, of Israel. Uh, at this period of time, they were the suppressors. At this period of time, they were the enemy of um, Israel. And of all the, those that are, uh, are saved, if you will, if, if we could uh, for, for a moment uh, make that distinction, uh, those that are Israelites, they are the children of God. So if you allow me to embellish a little bit, so if we can see them as being the saved and then those um, that are not saved, they are ungodly or they're, they're the saved and they are the unsaved. 
Uh, there are the Israelites, and then there's everybody else, whether it is the Philistines, whether it's the Hittites, the Persians, the Amalekites, all of these, these different nations that come against them, they, they are the enemy. And the Lord had spoken in, in uh, scripture, telling them not to deal with them. And here it is. Uh, he sees uh, not uh, of those that are saved, but he sees the, someone that is unsaved. He says, now get her for me uh, to wife. Get her for me, for she is right in my own eyes. The phrase, she is right in my own eyes, it, it, it exemplifies the same mindset that the entire nation was in. The people did what was right in their own eyes. And of course, this is the reason for their, the suppressor to come. It is that, that when you do things that are right in your own eye and not what God has placed as should be, then you are in, in essence sinning. And so the suppressor, suppressor comes. Samson was the man of his time. Despite his parents' objections, he wanted a Philistine woman as his wife. Again, she did that which was right in his own eyes. So on one hand, we have, again, Israel, and we have uh, the nations around Israel, in this case, the Philistines. On one hand, you, you have the children of God, and you have the children of the world. On one hand, you have light, and on the other hand, you have darkness. On one hand, you have, have justice, and on the other hand, you have, have uh, chaos or you have injustice. First John 2 and 15 says this, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse number 16, for all that is in the world, what's in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And he goes on to says, uh, this is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, I want you to notice something here. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. What is in the world, the love, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. On one hand, you have God who is omniscient, who knows all things. On the other side, you have the devil. It may seem like he knows everything, but he doesn't. The devil is, is not omniscient. He does not know everything. He does not know what you're going to do in your lives, but he uh, has suspicions. He has a good idea. And let, let me uh, probe on this uh, a little further. The devil is not omniscient. He does not know everything. He did not know who Samson was. Uh, because I remember uh, those who were around him did not know where his strength lied or that piece they did not know. They saw a man that was able to operate and do uh, uh, feats that were above that of a human. They, 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 they saw that, but they didn't know where it came from. Uh, he does, the devil did not know who the Christ child was. We find that we just um, talked about that uh, as we were speaking about Christmas. How do we know this? It's because the, the Bible says that, that the King Herod 
Uh, he didn't know. He 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 knew that a, a child, a Christ child, was being born. He didn't know where. He didn't know uh, who he was, and so he killed all of the boys that were two years or or younger. Why? Because in trying to get that particular one, he had to kill others in a hope that that would take care of that problem. So had he known who exactly it was and where exactly he was being born, perhaps uh, he would have sent his army of, of, of soldiers there to take him out. But that did not happen. He didn't really know who Jesus was, that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. How do we know this? In the fourth chapter of Matthew, uh, Jesus is tempted of, of the devil. And uh, he is fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And the enemy comes to him and he says, he said, if you be the Christ, command that these stones be made bread, if you be the Christ. Well, if he knew that was who he was, he wouldn't have had to ask. And certainly even uh, those that were, were, were with him had their, their, their questions. Um, John the Baptist sent messengers uh, uh, to Jesus uh, from his being in prison, from his prison cell, and said, are you the one or do we look for another? Even him, he did not have that knowledge. So with that then, the devil does not know about you, okay? He does not know your future. He does not know your position in God. He doesn't know your future or your destiny. He does not know about your weaknesses. He, it's, it's not something that he got through uh, being, being omniscient. He didn't get that information through being all-knowing. But he does know some things about us, and he he knows them through uh, learning about you, okay? Let me make that clear. He didn't know you. He didn't know your future. He didn't know, know uh, your, uh, your position in God, your destiny. He didn't know these things, but he learned them uh, through trial and error through testing you. How does he know you? Through testing you. The devil does not, the devil does know human behavior after centuries of study. Now notice this, if, if you, you're someone who lives in a 10,000 square foot home, okay? And your home is on a hill, and you can see the beach from that hillside. If you're planning to move somewhere else, a realtor is not going to take you to Compton, Compton, California, okay? In the hood to look for your next home. <laughs> You're not gonna do that. Why? Because he, he, he knows your history. He knows where you're living now. And he knows that that's not going to be a temptation to you, okay? The realtor knows you are living in this type of surrounding, so you're not going to want to go to something that is less, <clears throat> excuse me, than uh, what you have lived in. If your history has, has been one, all of us are tempted with different things. If your history has been one of uh, wanting desiring uh, money. And uh, 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 he, he sees that if he places the ability to get money um, or, or, or to uh, subvert monies to, to, to do this, he's going to use that. He is going to use that as a temptation. 
those who want to be well known, he'll use that type of pride. Man, the people know who you are. He'll use that against you. But, but he learns these things through our life. He learns these things through having his imps, his, his, his demons follow your life. And see, he'll first use things that are generalized. But as he sees how you respond to these different things, then he begins to target you using the things that he has learned. You see it, amen, with, with, with Adam. Adam had a relationship with God. It was a, an intimate relationship. God spoke to him every day. God had relationship. He walked and talked with him. But Adam was alone. He did not have the companionship as he saw the different animals of the kingdom having that type of relationship. He was alone. So God introduces him to a woman, Eve, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. The enemy sees this and says, well, maybe I can use this, amen, this, uh, this uh, thing that is now a new factor in his life. Maybe I can use that new factor in his life, amen, to test uh, the loyalty he has with God. So he uses the same thing that he has done throughout the ages, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He uses these things as instruments to tempt Adam. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the flesh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fruit, the lust of the eye, it's pleasing to his eyes. The lust of the flesh, uh, the lust or pride, it will cause one to be wise and will be like God. So the enemy has continued to use the same uh, three uh, tools. They, are, are, they come under different things now. Uh, not only uh, uh, does it, the, the tools that he uses have only been manufactured or remanufactured uh, to look different different generations, it has been used differently. Now we are in an age uh, of, of enlightenment uh, where knowledge has increased. And so even though it's the same thing, when you, it all boils down, it's the same thing, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, wanting to be somebody wanting to feel good in your flesh, wanting to look good, want people to know who you are. Those things have not changed, but the methods, the methods, you need to write that down, the methods have changed. Job was perfect and upright. The Bible says uh, that he, he loved God and, and he uh, um, would not do those things which were evil. But Satan says to him, well, you have a hedge around. There's a hedge around his monies. There's a hedge around uh, his wife. There's a hedge around his children. There's a hedge around his health. Uh, hey, but I tell you what, if you, if you remove those things, uh, I'll make you curse, curse you to your face. Satan asked for those things to, to be re removed. Why did he do this? because he did not know what Job would do. So thus the challenge. The enemy does not know what you will do, but he places these different things before you in, a, in a, an attempt to gather information that he can use in the future. The enemy knows, does not know what you will do but follows your life, I think I just said that, the decisions you make in life, the actions that you make in life, and then he strategizes a way of causing you to fail or to do his bidding. 
Samson was careless with his call. He knew the source of his superior strength. He knew that the spirit of God lived with him or drove with him or drove him. He knew that uh, he had been called to live a separated life. Nevertheless, Samson did what fed, felt good to him. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride. Samson was a man, the, the judge, or he was uh, to be the de deliverer of Israel, or the punishment, he was to execute punishment on the Philistines. In chapter number 15, uh, verse 15, we see that, that as they came in, the enemy came in like a flood. He found a jawbone of a donkey, or should I say the fresh jawbone of a donkey, put it in his hands, and with it struck and killed a thousand men. But I want you to note that it was the fresh jawbone of a donkey. One of the thing, one of the things that that uh, the vow, the the vow that he took, the, the Nazarite vow, was that he was not to uh, touch things that were dead. And clearly, here he did. Though too often his motives were more than suspect, Samson was God's agent to bring judgment on the Philistines. So even though his motives were in subject, uh, we, we, in suspect rather, uh, he was still God's man, God's agent at the time. It was clear that Samson was uh, that was that that the Philistines were afraid of. They were not his friends. And because he had that strength, uh, he was not afraid of them. It was his lot, however, to fight the Philistines alone. Interestingly enough, Samson was not like David, who was the captain over an army. Samson was a loner, and Samson fought his battles alone. He did not bring together an army. In fact, the, the men of Judah were, were very content to sit idly by because it was their preference uh, to to live in coexistence, in peaceful coexistence with the Philistines. Amen. Uh, they, they, they were just willing to let things be. But God yet said, they are an enemy of me. Or if we look at Christ Jesus, we could say they were an enemy of the cross. They were an enemy against him. Their faith, and I'm talking about those that sat idly by, their faith was compromised. They would not battle for the land that God had given them. They would not battle for the land that where they were assigned to take as their own. So in this part of the story, with a calm courage, walks he walks into the Philistine army. Samson, calm, knowing that God is with him. Calm courage, just walks into a man, the place of the enemy, and then places judgment upon them. Samson became a recognized and accepted leader of the Israelites. Bible says in uh, chapter 15 and verse number 20, and he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. 
this appears to be a time of peace for Samson. He walked in God's ways and Israel had true peace and stability apart from the Philistines. But that wasn't the end of the story. The fourth P is passion. Even though it is a time of peace, Samson's sinful flaws continues to dominate his, his soul and uh, he is severely flawed when it comes to sensuality and promiscuity. And the Philistines figured this out. So the enemy sees what his flaws are. This is what we're saying earlier. Uh, he learns what your flaws are. The devil learns what your passions are, your likes and dislikes. And he uses these to come up with strategy how to take you out. And so in chapter uh, 16, we find how Samson is set up. The Philistines won't, uh, or would, would, excuse me, the Philistines would try to take him without knowing the secret of his strength, and they were never able to do it. So they brought in a secret weapon. They brought in a woman, and this woman was Delilah. She was willing to play Samson. She was more than willing to betray his confidence. Samson was deceived and controlled by his own lust for Delilah. That's in chapter 16. After attempting to find out three times what caused his strength, Delilah continues to harp away the mystery. And she says, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and, uh, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. Again, uh, they're, 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 they're looking to find out where the strength lies. The enemy did not know this. But how many know that, that, that he can wear you down to the, to the extent uh, where you will, will just give in? This is what, what he did. And when uh, she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed, vexed unto death. And he told her all his heart and said, a, a razor never came upon my head for I am as a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaven, then my strength will leave and I will become uh, weak and be like any other man. In spite of great strength, Samson is, is strong, is not strong enough. Let me say that again. In spite his great strength, Samson is not strong enough to control his own impulses. He has gotten to the point that there is nothing he wouldn't do for her. So even though uh, it was obvious she was laying a trap, he still succumbed to the temptation. As she nagged and cries, Samson does not sense the danger. So she tells him and lulls him to, to sleep. You know the story. Because of this, because of his moral blindness, he is physically blinded. He is physically humiliated. Um, in verse number 20, and she said, the Philistines are upon you. This is after uh, she has brought someone in to cut his head. Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Samson now knew betrayal 
had taken him. That the secret that he had given to the Delilah, she didn't keep it to herself. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. She caused him to lose his hair and ultimately lose his strength. When the Philistines got a hold of them, they bore out his eyes, put him in prison, and then worked him. They binded him, bound him, and broke him. Three Bs. They binded him, they bound him, and broke him. He was humiliated, incarcerated. A man of God who had been uh, a champion, a man of God who had, had God had used against the Philistines, now caused him to be again blind, bound, and broken. The fifth component in these next, the last few minutes, is the last P. S. Samson's prayer, chapter 16, verse 25. And when their hearts were merry, they said, call Samson that he might entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison and entertained them. They made him stand between pillars. Samson had begun, had become the laughing stock of the enemy. And this great feast in honor of their God Dagon, they called for Samson and, and brought him out so they can ridicule him and ab abuse him. It gave them a great delight to mock the God of Samson. But the hours, days, and months in, in prison had not been wasted time with him. As he lamented in prison, he reflected upon his errors, and Samson prayed. God heard his prayer in the midst of the two pillars. He said to God, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O oh God, that I, I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Note the word, please. God honors that prayer. God restores his strength. And he successfully pulls down and I want to call the temple of doom. And in so doing, he became a true judge of Israel, willing to die and sacrifice his own life in order to defeat the enemy. It was a prayer of dependency. It was a statement of faith. So it is in this, in this moment, that he prays to God. God not only answers his prayer, I want to be avenged for my two eyes. He brings down the temple and in his death kills more Philistines than he had done in his entire life. I want to say to you, it takes courage to recognize where you are. It takes courage to ask God to strengthen you one more time. Don't care where you are, what it is that you've done, God can strengthen you one more time. We are not a God that is, that is, is, is judging us to this, this extent, but we serve a God who is full of grace and truth full of mercies, so much so that his mercies are renewed each day. So 
right where you are, and you can ask God, Lord, do a new thing in my life, Lord. God, I, I learned from Samson. I learned uh, that weaknesses, the enemy can find out what they are and can, can try to, to, to uh, bring me down because of those weaknesses. Tonight, let the weak say I'm strong. Tonight, let faith rise, rise and doubt cease. For God is able to bring you out of right where you are tonight. This is Bishop George McCree, and I'm the pastor of New Vision Christian Fellowship Church here in Mesa, Arizona. The address of our church is 9350 East Brown Road, again, in Mesa. Our service times on Sundays are at 2 p.m. And if you are in our area, we'd love for you to come come out and be with us. I believe that God has more for you. God wants to, to show you all that he wants to do in your life. And so make it your point to get to, amen, one of the places that God is, is speaking, amen. And not only does he want you to be there, he wants you to learn. Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. You'll find rest for your soul. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer. Good night.